St. Peter Chrysologus, First Sermon on the Creed. The sudden and surprising disruption occasioned by a premature delivery would be worrying me. The birth of children ahead of schedule would be causing me great distress if those about to be born, by their persistence in bursting asunder any obstacles of time, and by breaking through the confines of the womb with brute force, were not in such a hurry in their quest to grab hold of all the advantages of being alive. And so it is that a human being, perceiving the limit of the tenth month, often in the seventh month, breaks out of the narrow confines of his first home and the constricted space of the womb, and leaves it all behind in order that this newborn warrior might rejoice that he has conquered time even before falling under the sway of time himself. And if this is possible for human nature, what will be able to prevent it from happening for the heavenly and divine nature? Or why can't the Holy Spirit do this, if the flesh can? Or how does grace from above not achieve what human frailty obtains and accomplishes? Wasn't this the case with Paul, as he afflicted the way and the womb of our mother with sharp pain, so that with his heavenly whirlwind and violent tempest, he might stay one step ahead of the church as she labored to give birth, such that all of a sudden on the way he was born who would offer to the Gentiles the way to faith. Wasn't it right that he called himself one who was prematurely born and marveled that he had been born at all since he knew that he had not spent any time in the womb? Indeed, he was still an enemy when he was striking the womb of our Holy Mother from the outside and was crushing her venerable children at the very moment of their birth. Suddenly, he who had been the most ferocious persecutor of these very offspring is changed into a holy offspring himself. A eunuch was also brought to life on the road. After human recklessness had castrated him so as to serve human beings, and a forced chastity had placed him in the court of the king, voluntary and vowed chastity would promote and transfer him to the glory of the heavenly court and to the service of the eternal king. Blessed is he to whom it was granted not to lose the privileges of the palace, but to change them. My reason for saying this, my dear children, is so that after having received you now in sadness, at one and the same moment we may lead you forth in great gladness to your mother's womb. Listen to the faith, learn the prayer. But because of time constraints, since we are unable to open up the mystery to you, and you are unable to give a solemn recitation from memory to us of what is being handed over to you, see to it now that you simply learn the words of the Creed, and that in the Easter season, when these things are explained more fully, you can understand the deeper meanings of this same mystery. Take the thing that you want, take possession of what you desire, since the kingdom of heaven is enduring violence, and those who do violence snatch it away. Take the thing that you want, and may grace bestow what violence can take away. The entrance to life, the gateway of salvation, the beginning of faith is clearly shown to consist in a unique, innocent, and pure profession, as the prophet says, enter his gates with profession. 
And so the same prophet, having been given such a reminder, soon afterwards asks for a means of access to God to have him speak to him, as he says, Open to me the gates of righteousness, so that I might enter through them and profess to the Lord. You see that one cannot profess if he has not entered this house of salvation and faith. And just as profession admits one to this house, so too there is no doubt that denial excludes one from it. But let us hear what must be professed. Believing with the heart, the apostle says, leads to justification. Professing with your mouth leads to salvation. And he shows what must be believed. He says that if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, and you profess this with your mouth, you will be saved. Believing with the heart leads to justification. Professing with your mouth leads to salvation. As a result, my dear children, we see that this summary of our faith is a great thing, since between the heart and the tongue, the whole mystery of human salvation is up for consideration and is being accomplished. You have, O oh man, the manner in which you ought to believe. Believing with the heart leads to justification. You have the manner in which you ought to make your profession. Profes professing with your mouth leads to salvation. And what shall I say? The human being who has himself has everything within himself. However, he has himself if he has God. And he truly has God if he believes and professes that God is his creator. Make the sign of the cross. Faith, which is received by hearing, is believed with the heart, and is uttered by the mouth for salvation, must be placed in the sanctuary of our mind and must be committed to and kept alive in our very heart, lest it be written imprudently with paper and ink, and not be reserved for the faithful for life, but be revealed to unbelievers for their destruction. You must keep secure within yourself, O man, what will likely go to ruin with you to blame, if it is placed outside yourself. 